Welcome to the Answers Institute webinar series on response to intervention. The Alice Neely Special Education Research and Service Institute is part of the College of Education at Texas Christian University. The Answers Institute strives to provide high quality professional development for teachers and school leaders. This webinar, supported by the Morris Foundation of Fort Worth, is meant to further your professional development. We hope you enjoy it. The topic of this webinar is Response to Intervention, the Importance of Precise Planning. The webinar features Dr. Stephen Kukic, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at Cambian Learning. I am just very pleased to begin this series because I think this topic is one that uh, is a very essential one for us uh, in education today. Uh, we are in a position right now um, that I think is pretty unfortunate. Um, uh, if you can see my face in my hair, you know that it's uh, not black. My hair is not black anymore. <clears throat> and I was a, I was a special educator before there was a federal special ed law. And I'll tell you what um, what is um, uh, troubling me right now is that there are people who are questioning whether or not kids at risk and kids with disabilities sh should be a part of um, uh, the educational accountability system, uh, just like it was in 1971 when we were questioning this very thing. So we've got to figure out ways of proving that these students um, are uh, continue to be worthy of everyone's attention, which of course they have to be. Um, we fought the battle in 1975 to get that law passed that says there's a zero reject model for kids with disabilities, and now people are questioning that. Um, uh, I am proud to uh, be representing the company I work for also, Cambium Learning. Uh, we're a company that is dedicated to producing uh, evidence-based interventions uh, for teachers and educators to use. and um, uh, it's just a, a wonderful time to be an educator, and it's a difficult time. The, you know, the Chinese symbol for, for, for chaos says that it's a dangerous opportunity. And so with this dangerous opportunity, response to intervention is, is now at the tipping point around the country, and it's my pleasure to tell you about what's happening. So I'm going to move up a little bit closer here so I can get to the, uh, to the mouse. And uh, I just pressed the top of the mouse to go on. Yeah. Uh, so let's get going on this. And... Uh, you know, Jeff Sprague uh, is a person at the University of Oregon who is a real expert in behavior, and Jeff, Jeff suggests um, something that I think pretty interesting. He says, research strongly suggests that if schools raise their level of achievement, behavior decreases, and if schools work to decrease behavior problems, academics improve, so why not do both? What's beginning to happen is that people are beginning to understand that basic skills are not just academic skills, but they're also uh, behavioral skills that kids need to have when they leave school. Um, my unfortunate experience as an adult is that I've had to fire five, seven people in my career, and in all cases I did not fire anyone because of the, they were academically incompetent. I fired them because they were behaviorally incompetent. So we have to figure out a way to get back to this notion that, that both social competence and academic competence have to go hand in hand if we're going to be successful. That's the direction this RTI revolution is going. Now. Back in, in 2003, uh, the great Michael Fullan wrote a, a wonderful book um, uh, that was called uh, Change Forces uh, with a Vengeance. And he talked about this idea um, that there are these eight lessons that we have to pay attention to if we're going to have success in schools. Uh, lesson number one, I'm not going to go through all of them, but lesson number one says give up the idea that the pace of change will slow down because it will not slow down. All of you uh, who are on this webinar can, can feel this. Uh, both physically and spiritually, as, as well as professionally, that that the pace of change is only speeding up. Uh, the look at look at lesson number three. I've underlined it. Changing context is the focus. One of the problems I think we have in school is that we do an initiative in an elementary school to make it better, but we don't pay attention to what's happening in middle school or high school. So that the kids begin to really improve in, in at the elementary level, but they're improving in a way that is not acceptable. Uh, to the uh, people in the middle school. So we have to pay attention to that, to that transition. We have to pay attention to the context bigger than where we work. If we're in a classroom, good, but what's happening in the school that will reinforce what's happening in the, cl in, in, in the classroom. If we're in a school, good, what's happening with the district to reinforce what's happening in the school. Uh, and that applies as you go forward all the way up to the federal level. Um, I, I, I like the, the last one, uh, and I didn't like it when I first read it because uh, I'm a pretty hyper um, uh, uh, in, emotional person. So when he said charismatic change, um, or leadership rather, is negatively associated with sustainability, that bothered me. But what, what he meant by that is, is, that, is that egocentric leadership does not lead to sustainability. Uh, it's only when you are dedicated to the mission you're trying to accomplish that you have a chance of being successful with kids. 
So with that in mind, here is Fullen's idea. Fullen's idea is that you have to have a deliberate strategy, and the strategy is raise the bar and close the gap with a vengeance. Um, the one thing I think that he made a mistake about uh, in his writing, um, and the only mistake in the in the 20 years I've been uh, paying attention to Fullen, is his idea of what the gap is that we're trying to close. I think it's a mistake to say that we're trying to close the gap between poor kids and middle class kids, or between African American poor kids and and, and white kids who are middle class, or between kids with disabilities and kids without disabilities, or kids with, who are English learners versus those who are not. Because I know two ways of doing that. One way is, is, is to quit spending money on the kids who are achieving at a higher level and continue to let the, the, the lower achieving kids continue to achieve at the low level. If you do that, the kids at the higher levels will, will have, have their achievement be muted and you will close the gap if you measure the gap. The gap we're trying to close is the gap between where each child is and what the standard says about where that child should be. That's a, that's a really important point, I think, that, that, that we've got to think in a criterion reference way here. It's really wonderful when you see comparative analysis that says that, you know, we're the best at, at a particular group of kids in our school district, but only 50% of the kids are competent, and 50% of the kids have, have, have arrived at the standard. Uh, that doesn't mean we're successful. It's only, we're only successful when the vast majority of our kids are at the standard. That's the point. So with that point in mind, uh, I wanted to show you a couple of real quick ideas of, of what, what people have done around the country related to this issue. Uh, these are some of my favorite people in all of America. They're in South Dakota. Larry Brentrow, an Anglo guy, and Martin Brokenleg, a Lakota Sioux uh, medicine man, met at the University of Michigan. Uh, and they decided to try to put together Lakota Sioux spirituality with Northern European science and came up with this idea of a circle of courage. Uh, and uh, on the right-hand side of that, of that model, you'll notice the word belonging. Uh, and Larry told me that, that on an Indian symbol, that's a very important, the uh, preeminent place on an Indian symbol because that's where the sun rises, that's the east. So belonging is the key issue. Uh, I ask you to think about this if you're in, if you're in a school system as you increase grade levels, it often is true that the only way that you feel a sense of belonging is if you're achieving in a traditional way. And if you don't achieve in a traditional way, then in fact you do not feel the sense of belonging. But when Maslow did his hierarchy of needs, uh, he said that the, that the need to feel that, that you belong is a more basic need than the need to achieve. So what we've got to do is create schools where all kids feel a sense of belonging so that they can then have the strength to be able to move on in this model. If you go around uh, count, uh, clockwise, you'll notice that mastery is there and then independence and then as a nod to uh, a, a kind of a, a Native American way of raising kids, as you're, as you're growing your kids to be independent, you also want to grow them to be generous. So that's a really nice model that I've seen used in lots of schools as a kind of a spiritual and principle-centered kind of a basis for all that they do, uh, and um, uh, that's a nice model. Another model came from the Far West Labs when they were asked the question, so what should schools do for students at risk? And they said, well, one thing is make students at risk a priority in the school. Um, I have um, uh, warned people that if I, ever, if I ever become a principal again or if I become a local superintendent in my career, um, I'm not going to make at-risk kids a priority in the school. I'm going to make at-risk kids the priority of the school. Because when you do that, 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 that kind of firms up everything you're doing in relationship to students. Um, I contend that we should view every student who enters school as a kindergartner or a pre-K kid as an English learner, every single student. And what they're trying to learn is academic English. And so if you treated kids that way, you'd be, you'd be a lot more systematic about the way you uh, operate with kids. Taking a comprehensive approach is what the Far West Lab said. The Far West Labs goes on to say that we've got to invest in staff development and raise expectations for these kids. Um, uh, I was in state government in Utah as the state director for all the at-risk programs for 11 years, and then I went to work for Stephen Covey, uh, who just passed on, unfortunately. And uh, uh, Stephen Covey is, is one of my mentors of all mentors. Uh, and he came up with a model that says that the way you see the world determines what you do and that determines what you get. So think about that model for a moment. The way you see the world determines what you do, and that determines what you get. So when we ask people to do something different to try to raise achievement, if we ask them to do something that is contradictory to the way they see the world, then they will revert back to behaviors that, in fact, are, be are consistent with the way they see the world. The best example of that that I know are, uh, is this example. If you have a school at an elementary level, if you have a school full of great educators who have a constructivist ideology about the way to teach reading, 
and you give them a basal to use that is a research-based basal that takes a perspective about explicit instruction and, and making sure that kids have their basic skills intact before you move on, if you don't really work sensitively with those folks, they're going to revert back to behaviors that are consistent with their constructivist ideology, not implement the basal in the way that it was intended to be implemented, and they're not going to get the results that they would like to get. So one of the biggest problems we have with the way we see the world is our decreased expectations for at-risk kids. There's no question that that's true. The latest um, research I've read about this says that only 62% of special ed teachers believe that all kids can learn in the country. Only 62%. Now just think about that for a moment in terms of what that means we do with kids in classrooms. So the other three are intervening early and coordinating instruction for all the students and providing more quality time. Um, the, the great George Batch at the University of South Florida is, is really spending time on a notion called engage time uh, because that's really the issue. If you engage kids in what they should be doing for more and more time, which is not like a surprising finding, of course, uh, they have a greater tendency to learn at a higher level. So one of the greatest books that I think has been written lately uh, in our field of education is this one by Anita Archer and Charlie Hughes in 2011. It's called Explicit Instruction. Uh, what I do for our company is, is um, live on United Airlines because I live in Denver. My, my wife says I don't live in Longmont, Colorado, like our address says. I live on United Airlines, and I do. And, and I travel around the country helping school districts and state departments realize the potential of RTI. And one of the things I'm noticing is that, that in some districts, when you say the word explicit in front of the word instruction, people turn you off. Um, I was in one district where they were showing me their data about kids, and they were successfully placing kids into instructional groups based on their needs. That was nice. I, I noticed that every single intervention they were suggesting was a teacher-made strategy for differentiating instruction. So at the end of the time, they asked if I had a question, and I said, well, yes, what if a child needs an, in, an intensive intervention? rather than a, a, a universal intervention, a tier one intervention, which is a teacher-made strategy for differentiating instruction. They said, oh yeah, we know about that, in, that, that intensive instruction thing, and we're willing to talk about it as long as that intensive, instruction, that intensive intervention does not have explicit instruction in it, because we don't believe it's explicit. <laughs> now, when you, when you hear that from a, a group of, of, of educators who are trying to do a good job, that means that they have not shifted their paradigm from making decisions based on their, 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 uh, their ideology, their favorite ideology, the one they love the most, their tradition, to a, a paradigm that says, if it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, stop it. Anita said uh, recently um, that uh, when asked the question, how do we deal with the reading wars that are still going on in school, she says, well, if you've got a group of kids who are learning how to read using a balanced, uh, a balanced literacy approach, then good, keep doing it. If you've got a group of kids in your school who are not learning how to read using a balanced literacy approach, stop. <laughs> Figure out something else to do because the issue is whether or not kids have learned. So these 16 elements uh, kind of reflect the latest compilation of the 40 years of research we have on the effect of schools literature. So this is another kind of a structure, a context for what we should be doing. Last comment about this is that Anita says that good teaching is real simple. It's a combination, but it's not real simple. It's a combination of structure and relationships. You can't be a good teacher if all you care about is relationships. You can't be a good teacher if all you care about is structure. It's a combination of the two. And this book is a really wonderful celebration of that notion. Uh, Dufour has obviously had a big impact on, on, on the whole country and his work on professional learning communities. And what, what troubles me a, a bit about this is that, is that people think that if they lose their one hour of a meeting time as a professional learning community, then they aren't a professional learning community anymore. And that's not what Rick Dufour talks about. What Rick Dufour talks about is a stretch culture. And that stretch culture is a culture where you do whatever it takes for all the kids to learn. Um, that's, the, that's the bottom line notion of, of what a professional learning community is. His four questions, I think, are important to remember. Do we know what we want kids to learn? Do we have a way of assessing whether they've learned it? What do we do when kids don't learn it? And then the last question that he's added in the last couple of years is, what do we do when kids learn it too fast? <laughs> How do we deal with that? So those four things have to be answered for uh, any school to really call itself a professional learning community, another structure, another context. Uh, I created these, these five questions because I thought they, they would be helpful for people to think about the context in which they're doing their work. So number one says, how would outcomes and practice be affected if we made educational decisions based on student outcome data versus tradition? A good question to be asking, I think. 
What would happen if we focused our school reform efforts on the needs of students at risk rather than on the needs of students who don't need effective instruction to learn proficiently? You know, I, I have a daughter, Stephanie, um, who's uh, got her master's degree and she works at the University of Colorado Boulder and she's a very successful adult. Uh, and she could have learned uh, with, with, really with a cardboard cutout of a teacher in front of her because she was a student. And she entered school as a student because of her nasty parents who demanded of that of her. <laughs> and, and she knew how to read before she got to school, et cetera. But we shouldn't build our school reform efforts around the needs of those kids. We should build our school reform efforts around the needs of at-risk kids. Uh, I'm working most extensively in a, in a school district in Kansas called Wichita. Wichita is a district of 50,000 kids. It's an urban district with lots of gangs and uh, over 100 languages, lots of poverty. And three years ago, they decided, with no pilot projects, which I think are the bane of our existence, they decided we're going to go for this pre-K-12 and we're going to build a multi-tier system of supports. Those of you who are in this webinar, that's the key, one of the key phrases I think you need to remember. Multi-tier system of supports, MTSS. That phrase, that definition is going to be in the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act when it's reauthorized, and I believe that will happen next year. And, and what's the significance of that? Well, in Wichita, they're, they're, they're doing exactly what researchers say about systems change. They're not going slow. They're not going piecemeal. They're going for it. And they're building their system around the needs of at-risk kids, and they're being successful with it in, in terms of their data. Number three, how important is the context of school structure for intervention success? Uh, number four, what should be the balance between academic and behavioral intervention? And then what is your action plan related to this thing called response to instruction, response to intervention? Um, and that's really the point of this whole webinar. Um, one, last, one last kind of a bit of context. In 2003, the Learning First Alliance did some research at the district level and said, let's, let's try to differentiate between districts that are having success and improving outcomes from those that are not having success. I call your attention to just two of these findings. Number four, districts made decisions based on data and not instinct, reinforcing the points that have been made so far. And then number seven is the critical point, districts committed to sustaining reform over the long haul. Uh, when I met Wichita, they were between superintendents. I met first with the school board and convinced them to redo their five-year strategic plan. They hired a superintendent to implement that plan and then began to build their multi-tier system of supports around that vision. Uh, and that really does make some good sense because it is, just, it is just horrific what happens. Usually in a school district when there's a new superintendent, everything is blown apart. You can't get on the website for a while until the superintendent gets his or her kind of uh, bearings and then you have a whole new direction and that's what makes uh, for difficulty in terms of getting things done. So, you know, when, when, when uh, the, the, the great Colin Powell um, retired uh, from being the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he and his wife formed America's Promise. And these are the five promises related to the America's Promise that, that, that every child in America needs to have. I've quoted Balfons um, et, et al. in 2009. Any of you who are, who are uh, at the secondary level, uh, you need to, to Google Balfons and America's Promise. You will find Grad Nation. Grad Nation is the best dropout prevention system that I've ever seen. Uh, and it's all in the public domain, and it's all ready to be used by anyone who's uh, on this webinar and anyone around the country. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, so this is, this is really an, an important piece of work, I think, that's been done. Um, so, so in that work that they've done, uh, they, they, they said that school achievement, school engagement, and life outside the school are all three things you have to pay attention to. So, so I think that's really an important part of this idea of, of using RTI as a catalyst for systems change because this thing about life outside the school is absolutely essential to pay attention to. Um, there's a nice correlation um, between um, kids who need a more and more intensive intervention and families of those kids and those kids who need services from other agencies. Um, and so there needs to be a connection with the whole community is the point, and that's the, obviously the point of America's Promise. So Donald and Anton, who used to be the special ed director in LA, took me aside in 2007 in her assertive way, and she said, Steve, just remember that context is everything. So um, I, I want to suggest to you from my work uh, at, at Covey um, and with Covey that his idea that these are the three constants in life, change, principles, and choice, I think makes sense, and I want you to think about this as we get into this a little more deeply. First of all, change is a constant, I think you would all agree, and Covey taught us that the only defense we have is to have a set of principles that don't change. 
He called it changelessness. And if you have that set of principles, you can defend yourself against this ever-changing world. So I ask all the participants in the webinar, what are the principles that direct your practice? When I go into a school district and I, I ask them for their mission statement, and if they say to me the mission statement guides what we do, the verb guides what we do, I told, tell them to throw away the mission statement because it's not a mission statement. Mission statements don't guide what you do. Mission statements direct your activities. Principles don't guide what you do. Principles, if they're really principles, direct what you do. So what are the principles that direct your practice as a professional educator is my question. And then the last constant is this issue of choice. Uh, and Covey's notion that he learned from Viktor Frankl is you always have a choice about how you respond to what somebody else has done to, uh, done to you or, or what a situation is. Um, and I think that's a very important issue because how do we keep our optimism in these times of, 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 of almost impossible conversations at a policy level? Uh, well, how do you do it? You choose to do it, and you choose to remain optimistic. That's the point. So I think those are three really important parts of this conversation. Uh, the great Yogi Berra, another great philosopher, said, in theory there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. <laughs> You know, the, the, the dilemma we've got is that you can talk at a, at a, at up in the clouds all you want to, but when you get down into it, into the chaos of the school, um, there really is a difference between theory and practice. One other thing Yogi said one time, he said, uh, no one goes to that restaurant anymore, it's too crowded. I want you to think about that for a minute. And that shows the wisdom of Yogi Berra, because we've all been at that position where we don't go to our favorite restaurant anymore because it's too crowded. No one goes there anymore because it's too crowded. But his point, I think, is, is, is very beautifully taken. I have to quote Harry Potter often because my oldest granddaughter and I read all those books together. And uh, Dumbledore taught, taught part of Potter so much. And he, one thing he taught him was, it's our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. So if this really is a set of choices that we're, that, we're, that we're thinking about. The great Randy Pausch, who, was that, the, who did the last lecture, you know, the, 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 the professor from Carnegie Mellon who found out that he, that he had very, very bad um, cancer and he was going to die within three to six months, but he still had the chance to give the last lecture at his university, he said, brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. That's really the point, I think, that I think is an important philosophical point. So um, as a former state bureaucrat, I have to have an acronym, and I, otherwise I can't, I can't like breathe. So uh, and the acronyms I love are the ones that spell something. So here's the word chaos. Uh, up on the top of that slide, you'll notice the, the, a call to action, the relentless pursuit of excellence, and then the, term, the phrase, thriving on chaos. That shows the ultimate choice, I think. Are we going to choose to survive the chaos of our school day, or are we going to thrive on that chaos? Um, and, and this was a book by Tom Peters way back in the 80s. Uh, and so I decided that this really does reflect what, what we're trying to do uh, with RTI. On the bottom right-hand corner, of the slide, you'll see a circular model that I'll be talking about in just a little bit. And that really is the morphing of RTI into this concept called multi-tier system of supports. So the word chaos, let me tell you what that stands for. Uh, the C stands for collaboration with one purpose to improve achievement. The H, a hierarchy of tiered, effective, academic, and behavioral interventions that are implemented with fidelity. The A stands for the mindset, all, some, and few as the consistent focus. The O stands for one child at a time, making instructional decisions based on progress monitoring data and not our favorite ideology. And the S stands for systems change with coherence to close the gap. So what I want to do for the rest of the time we're together is use that structure to talk about what's happening with RTI. So let's start with the, with the C word, uh, collaboration with one purpose to improve achievement. Um, any of you who have responsibility for bringing consultants into where you work, uh, repent from ever bringing in someone who's an expert in collaboration if they say to you, I'm going to show you all how to collaborate because collaboration is such a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Wrong. We're in a business in schools to improve achievement. If we, cannot, if we cannot determine that that consultation is helping us to improve achievement, then we ought to not do the consultation. If we cannot determine that what we're about to buy as a school system is an intervention that will improve achievement based on the independent data that exists to support it, then we shouldn't be buying the intervention. I work for a company that, that provides interventions, and, I, and I'm going to say this, say this very clearly to you. D please stop doing two things if you, if you find yourself doing either one of them. One, never buy an intervention from a company that only has internal research to support uh, its claim that it's a good intervention. Always demand independent validation. 
that it actually works. And the second thing is stop buying stuff from, from companies that give you a lot of free stuff. What I'm noticing around the country is that people have a tendency to use that as the primary criterion for buying basils and textbooks and interventions and technology and whatever. Whichever company gives us the free stuff, they must be the best. Well, guess why they're giving you free stuff? Think about that. So the whole idea is collaboration with one purpose and everything else we do in schools to improve achievement. So just I, I would just mention this African proverb, if you wish to go quickly, go alone, but if you wish to go far, go together. The research that's happening on school change is very clear that the schools that are having the most success, the districts that are having the most success, are the systems that work as a collaborative unit toward the mission of, of, of making sure that all kids achieve at a high level. I would, I would refer you to Michael Fullan's latest book that is called Moral Imperative Realized. Moral Imperative Realized. And in that book, he has case studies from all over the country of school systems that prove this very point. So let's move on to the, to the H word. Uh, this is the essence of what this RTI revolution is trying to do. A hierarchy of tiered, effective, academic, and behavioral interventions implemented with fidelity. One of, the, one of the hallmarks of school systems that are having success with kids is that, that they implement their investments with fidelity. One of the reasons why we keep moving from intervention to intervention, from basal to basal, from textbook to textbook, is because we do not implement them with fidelity. And guess what? We don't get the result. And then we say, oh, that meant that the intervention didn't work, so let's go buy another one. Rather than dedicating ourselves to what professionals of all sorts do, um, there's a wonderful surgeon from Harvard named Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E, who wrote a book that is called The Checklist Manifesto. And, and what he, the premise of the book is, is that he was finding in his surgery suite at Harvard that there, was a, that, that there were a lot of infections and too many infections from the surgeries. And so he asked the question to the surgery team, why is that happening? And all the surgeons said, well, certainly not us, because after all, we're all board-certified surgeons and we're at Harvard af after all. So then he asked the operating room nurse, why is it happening? And she said, well, I know why it's happening. It's because when the anesthesiologist is putting the person to sleep, the anesthesiologist is not at the right moment uh, injecting the antibiotic into the person so that the antibiotic gets to the place where the first cut is made for the surgery. And when that happens, you increase the probability of infection. So Gwandi was smart enough to say to the operating room nurse, well, now you're in charge of when the, the, the scalpel can be picked up. It can only be picked up when we follow the checklist. So one other quick example I'll give you of that is he asked Sully Sullenberger, the pilot of that U.S. air jet that flew the jet into the Hudson River and everyone was safe. Um, he said, now you certainly didn't follow a checklist, did you, Captain Sullenberger, because that was amazing. And Sullenberger said, the only thing I did that was creative was keeping uh, the wings equidistant, uh, equidistant above the waves as we, as we came into that river. Otherwise, that would not have been good. But otherwise, when the birds flew into birth, both wings as we took off from LaGuardia and the engine stopped, the co-pilot and I met in the middle of the cockpit to find the checklist. And if we would have followed the checklist, we would have killed people. Now, I don't get why in education we celebrate our creativity to the, to the point where we implement nothing with fidelity in many places. That's not professional. That's not professional. So this is the essence of what the RTI revolution is about. Dufour said in 2004 uh, this point is our response based on intervention rather than remediation? Is our response systematic? Is it timely? Is it directive? In the Wichita School District, they have four non-negotiables to direct what they're doing with this building of this sustainable multi-tier system of supports. One of their non-negotiables says that they will have standard protocols across the district related to assessment, instruction, intervention, academically and behaviorally, which means it's not every teacher choosing what they want to do, and then using it creatively. If for some decisions, a district-wide decision makes some sense in Wichita. I ask all of you to, to think about this for a moment. Think of your pay stub. Um, on the bottom right-hand corner of the pay stub is a number that's too small. On the top of the pay stub is the organization that pays you. If you are in a single school charter school, then it says the name of your school. If you're in a school district, it does not say the name of your school. It says the name of your school district. The, the, the research and practice that's going on now is saying that site-based decision-making, as much as we love it as adults, is not working to increase the achievement of our at-risk kids. 
What does work is when a school district establishes, as Marzano and Waters taught us in their 2009 book called District Leadership That Works, in that Marzano and Waters book, given their meta-analysis, they prove the point that when districts have a limited number of non-negotiables and then do site-based decision-making in the context of those non-negotiables, they have success. That's what Wichita, LAUSD, uh, Boston, several other places are doing around the country, and, and they're having great effect with it. So we suggest at this point, and this has a copyright, I forget that, the, the, what we're suggesting to people is do an intervention inventory where you work. Make sure you've got um, uh, interventions that deal with uh, all of the issues, in this case it's for reading, so we use, we use the big five um, uh, parts of early reading uh, here uh, that came from 30 years of research from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and, and do you have interventions for all kids, some kids, and few kids? That's the, that's the issue across grade levels. So that makes some practical sense to us. I, I'd ask you to think about where you work and think about this model. This is the traditional RTI model. Uh, in fact, all of us joke in the RTI Revolutionary Army that we all have a triangle tattoo somewhere in our bodies. Um, I think I won't show you mine today, but, but, but uh, I'm trying to find a good tattoo remover right now because I think the triangle is getting in our way. We not only use the triangle as the, as, the, as the graphic for what we're doing with RTI, but we made the huge mistake of putting percentages across this triangle, saying that 80% of the kids are going to be helped just using universal interventions, then 15% will need uh, strategic interventions, and only 5% will need intensive interventions. Now, as I've gone around the country, I do not find that to be the case about what percent of kids need an intensive intervention. It's not 5%. Sometimes in school districts, the triangle is upside down, that most kids right now need an intensive intervention. And I do want to tell you something that George Sagai uh, told me in a, in a public meeting, the, the father of uh, positive behavior interventions and supports. He's the first person I ever saw put 80, 15, 5 on the triangle. And I asked him where he got that research, and he said, I hate to admit this, but it's not research. We just made that up because we wanted people to pay attention to prevention. Well, that's a good idea. But a big mistake that's happening in RTI right now is that there are some people who are saying we've got to fix Tier 1 first before we start thinking about Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions for kids. And the problem with that sequential play is that you're going to lose a generation of ninth graders who are achieving at the first grade level a generation of sixth graders who are achieving, achieving at the pre-primer level. So we got to do this simultaneously, fix tier one while we are providing interventions that, that, that these kids need who, who, who are in desperate shape. Um, people have asked me the, this question, so we don't have all the money in the world, where do we target? In my opinion, where you target is with kindergarten, first of all, do a Dibbles, a Dibbles or a Dibbles-like assessment of, of of kids coming into kindergarten, and if you've got a large proportion of your population who are not ready for school, then intervene with all of them. Do something drastic like an alternative core curriculum. Um, you know, there are other examples of this, but the one I know best is called ReWell, and ReWell works in many, many places in this country that way. Another place to do this is, is in the year before kids move to the next level of school. So in the sixth grade, if, you, if, if middle school starts in seventh, or fifth grade, if it starts in sixth, in, in the eighth or ninth grade, moving from middle or junior high up to high school, and then the last place is in the ninth grade or in the first year of high school. Those are places that I think where we really need to really think about intervening in a big time way with kids based on their needs. So the morphing of RTI has moved from the triangle to the idea of a circle, uh, and that's the new um, uh, tattoo that I want to get on my body. Is this idea? Steve? Of yes. This is Barbara. I just want to stop it's just for one second to underscore what I think you've made a, a very important point in your uh, last um, slide. And, and I just want to double check if I'm hearing you correctly. And that's, it doesn't sound like there's a strong research base, if any research base, around the idea of validating that RTI pyramid that we're also used to. Um, and A, is that correct? And B, in the slide that you're moving to, are you advocating for us to think of it in a more systematic and more circular, is what I think I saw in the next slide, manner? And Because and, this is a really important shift in thinking, and, and I'd like to understand that from you. Thank, thank you, Barbara. In fact, in fact, this model reflects, uh, I think, good thinking about what a multi-tier system of supports would look like. Um, and um, uh, notice I'm not embarrassed to say what I'm about to say. Um, 
Uh, it's our company that developed this over the last 20 years. Um, when I was state director in Utah, I was the first big customer of this little company in Longmont, Colorado, called Sopris West. And when I when I bought uh, uh, a ride, which is a computerized tactics bank for teachers to use for all the schools in the state of Utah, that was the biggest sale by far for that little company that year. And so they called me and said, "You're our new best friend. Why don't you be on our advisory committee?" So. I got on their advisory committee with uh, Jim Eiseldyke and Hill Walker and several other people from around the country. We began to think about what does a school look like that is, in fact, improving outcomes for all kids. And this is the latest iteration that I've shared with uh, many places, and um, many state departments have used this as the basis of developing their own version of a multi-tier system of supports. Um, uh, highlighted places would be Colorado and Kansas and Virginia have all use that. Many school districts have used this basic model to talk about this. Think of it this way. Think of the four components that are in the middle of this, assessments, curriculum interventions, instruction, and positive behavior interventions and supports. Think of those as, as um, uh, uh, tiers related to kids. So what percent of your kids need universal interventions, uh, strategic interventions, and in intensive interventions related to all of these issues? So what kind of assessment needs to be done for all kids? What kind of assessment needs to be done for kids who need something more strategic and something more intensive, et cetera, for the rest of those four models? When you get out to the, to the, the, the bigger circles that, that, that are concentric circles there, those are for adults. So you need to have an empowering culture that is the context for those four components. And then what supports the empowering culture is good leadership for for all, the, all the, uh, the people who are in the school, for the people who need strategic leadership, for the people who need intensive leadership. And then lastly, professional development is the last concentric circle. So this is a seven component model. It's not 97,000 components, it's just seven. Uh, and uh, the, we developed benchmarks and now I'll give you the example of the state of Kansas developed their own version of this. Um, that's the best, by the way, state department in the country in my view in terms of what they provided for their school districts, kansasmtss.org, kansasmtss.org, uh, and you will find wonderful resources that, that, that you can use. We decided with our model uh, to put the target, though, we had to see the triangle still there, sort of, uh, that, that we, we decided that, that the better way of saying what the, what the administration right now in D.C. is saying is not let's have all students be college and career ready, but let's have all students life ready. Because that really does reflect this idea of academics and behavior. That's the, that's the reason for it. So, so we're moving and morphing into this way of thinking about systems change uh, that's called multi-tier system of supports or MTSS. And this all started with this idea of a hierarchy of tiered effective academic and behavioral interventions implemented with fidelity. The A stands for all, some, and few as the consistent focus. And just a couple of quick slides about that. DeFore said in 2004, regardless of the motivation, contemporary public schools in the U.S. are now being called upon to achieve a standard that goes far beyond the goals of any previous generation. High levels of learning for all students, no exceptions. It really concerns me when you hear about an amendment to the, the earliest version of of the uh, reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act from a uh, representative from Georgia who said, um, I kn you know, he said, I know that there's this provision in ESEA that says you can only give 1% of your kids this alternate assessment, those kids who have significant disabilities. I, this amendment would, would, would take away that 1% provision and would allow you to give 100% of your kids the alternate assessment. Now, do you understand what that means? That means that we'll get better results for our school districts without improving performance of kids. It's, um, it's almost like, why don't we just exempt all the kids that are tough to teach? Then we'll look better. I'd like to say, as a proud citizen of this country, that we have the best educational system in the world. We do not. And we don't because we are making decisions based on adult needs and not based on kid needs. So that paradigm shift from making decisions based on tradition or your favorite ideology to making decisions based on what kids need is the critical issue, and that's the point DeFore makes. Uh, I wake up every morning thinking about this particular three-sentence quote from Ron Edmonds. He said this in 1982. 
Um, just think about this, everyone who's on this webinar. We can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. He said in 1982, we already know more than we need to do it. And his last sentence is the one that I think all of us need to think about each day. Whether or not we do it must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. Our decisions, our choices, reflect on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. I had a, a superintendent in, in Arizona tell me uh, in the last couple of years, he said, Steve, I don't know if we need more money in public ed. And I said, be quiet about that. Don't say that out loud. He said, I mean that because we have spent so much money on stuff that has a proven track record of not working with the kids we have. How do we know if we need more money? We've got to stop using those things that have a proven track record of not working with our kids, and then we'll find out whether or not we have money to be able to invest in evidence-based practice that does work with the populations of kids that we deal with. Whether we as adults like it or not, that's the point. So what is the guiding phrase in, in schools that really are professional learning communities? We do whatever it takes. That's the point. So that's the C and the H and the A. The O stands for one child at a time, instructional decisions based on progress monitoring data. Um, here's the standard Dufour said. He said, look at all policies, programs, practices. Does this impact uh, on student learning in a positive way? Those that encourage learning are embraced. Those that interfere with learning are discarded. We get rid of policies that do not, in fact, um, uh, help us to be able to encourage learning. Um, I, I love this comment from Dave Tilley, one of the generals of this RTI revolution. Uh, he's in, he's in uh, Iowa, now at the State Department in Iowa. He was asked what the big, big idea of RTI is, and he said these four things. Well, read these four things while I tell you this uh, quick story to tell you how old I am. Uh, my first uh, internship in graduate school at UCLA uh, when I was there as a school psych student uh, was at the University Elementary School in the fall of 1970. Female principal says this to us at that school. She says, sit down and listen. I'm going to tell you how to teach kids. The way you do it is you come up with a behavioral objective for what you want kids to be able to show you they can do when you're through teaching them. You have a way of assessing that behavioral objective directly. You teach to the behavioral objective. You monitor whether you've succeeded. Then you adjust your instruction and teach again. Any questions? That's good teaching. We said, well, thank you, ma'am. I thought you're being very declarative about that. Can we, like, know your name? She said, yeah, my name's Madeline Hunter. And any of you know the history of education in this country, you know, that's a pretty big name. But in 1970, she didn't know she was Madeline Hunter. She knew she was principal of the University Elementary School, and she had figured out how to do this. That, my friends, is 40 years ago, and we're still debating how to teach. It's amazing to me, just amazing. So what RTI is trying to do is rejuvenate our commitment to what works for kids. Stiggin says it differently in, this, in, in his 2002 work. He differentiates between formative and summative assessment by saying that the former is assessment for learning, while the latter is assessment of learning. You need both. So formative assessment, assessment for learning, versus a summative assessment, assessment of learning. Uh, it, really, it really is tragic when I hear teachers say, um, as soon as I get my state test results, um, I'll figure out how to change my instruction. Well, that sort of is reflective of what, of what Dufour said uh, in a wonderful, wonderful um, um, a statement. <laughs> he said, the difference between a formative assessment and a summative assessment has also been described as the difference between a physical and an autopsy. He said, in professional learning communities, we prefer physicals to autopsies. If you wait for state test results before you change your instruction, that's using an autopsy on your students because they're already gone. So it's much better to use physicals, which is this notion of formative assessment. Okay. So we're almost down to the very bottom of this. Um, and the S stands for systems change. Whoops. Systems change with coherence to close the achievement gap, and we've talked about this model. Uh, so the idea is to do things systemically rather than to do them in a piecemeal way or that even to do them slowly. When Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech in 1963, he said, not only I have a dream, he said, we've got to be very wary of the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. The civil rights movement would have never have moved forward if we would have done a pilot project in Mississippi about civil rights. Yet what we do in schools is we, we want to make everybody feel comfortable so, ooh, we can't go fast. So let's do a pilot project in one school with one teacher. Now, please tell me if you've been involved in a pilot project that has resulted in systems change that has been done that way. 
So we're encouraging people around the country to do pilot projects in zones or cones or whatever you want to call that. At least you've got to have an elementary school that feeds to a middle school that feeds to a high school because then you've got a K-12 continuum to do that pilot and you can really find out whether or not it works. And one of the real experts in this is, is my friend Joanne Elaine, um, who I, I, I included uh, some slides from her for this presentation because she really knows this, this notion about precise planning. She uh, wrote a couple of books, in fact, um, and uh, it, they are published by us, but I didn't include her because of that, um, believe it or not. Um, they're called The Logistics of Literacy Intervention. The Logistics of Literacy Intervention. She takes all these principles and puts them down into schools and classrooms in beautiful ways. She says at the, at, the, at, the, at the secondary level, as an example, and this applies to from about grade four on, in fact, um, to think about this notion. How do you create your schedule? And when you get to middle school and high school, it's a formal master schedule. Who are the first kids put on that master schedule, she asks. If the answer is the traditional answer, band members, bright kids, football players, then she says you're not very ready for RTI. If the answer is, well, obviously we put the at-risk kids on the master schedule first because some of those kids need two periods a day of literacy instruction. And we couldn't do it if we didn't put them on the master schedule first. That, those are the schools that are more ready for RTI. So in this mix of slides, you're going to see some information from Joanne. And I want to remind you, there's her, there's her website and there's her uh, email address if you're interested in having Joanne come in to work for you. Uh, and uh, she does not work for our company. She's got her own consulting firm. Take a look at what Joanne has to offer. She is grand. So option number one is notice that all English and language arts or math classes are scheduled throughout the day and are heterogeneously grouped. A reading or math support elective, this is funny, a mandatory elective, is added to the schedule to allow for Tier 2 intervention. Kids who need Tier 3 intervention receive two periods of intensive instruction in addition to language arts or, or math. Bridger Middle School in Clark County in Nevada, in Las Vegas, did an assessment of their kids, found out that 90% of their middle school kids needed a Tier 3 intervention, 90. So then they began to think, well, what are those kids getting out of looking at their language arts textbook every day if 90% of them need an intensive intervention? I, I, really, I really question people around the country when they say, kids have to be in the general ed curriculum every day, every period, every minute. Well, what if you've got a ninth grader reading at the first grade level, what is the kid getting out of it? A sixth grader reading at the pre primer level, what is that kid getting out of that? So what they did at Bridger is, is that fine, they did a language arts period, but the next period they implemented an intensive intervention. A language exclamation point was their choice. But what they, they did that to be able to build the skills kids need to be able to compete in the general ed curriculum. That was the point. So you can see the rest of what is, what is said there, that the intervention classes are blended, and these classes are scheduled during the same period as much as possible for Tier 2 and 3. Option number two, uh, again, these classes are, are scheduled throughout the day, the general ed classes. They're heterogeneously grouped. But now students are pulled out for Tier 2 or Tier 3 intervention during other classes, one period for Tier 2, two periods for Tier 3. That's another sort of a model that, that can work. So, um, uh, so Joanne comes up with an, a third option, where English and language arts or math classes are double blocked. One period core credit, one period elective. English language arts or math classes are scheduled at the same time of the day. English language arts classes are homogeneously grouped um, based on assessed need and grade level. And I, I've got to stop myself here in this flow and say this. One of the mistakes we're making in the RTI revolution right now is that we're beginning to tier kids. That's a tier three kid. I don't know what that means. I want you to think about that. Think about special ed kids for a minute. The average special ed kid is in general ed for more than half the day. That being the case, that child every day is getting tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions. So rather than labeling kids as tier one, tier two, or tier three, avoid that. Label your, your interventions in a tiered way. Don't label kids in a tiered way, if that makes sense. So anyway, she suggests in this, in this third tier that, that you've got these homogeneously grouped uh, classes based on assessed needs. Um, notice pacing, intensity, content, exposure to the core, and explicit instruction are based on assessed needs. Some kids need an alternative core curriculum. Other kids don't. And classes are blended across populations. There's a really important issue, I think. Um, I want to say, uh, because I'm on the board of directors for the National Center for Learning Disabilities, um, 
in, uh, in this is a great organization. Um, uh, Lindy Crawford and I have both been involved with this organization for a long time. I want to say that there are different interventions for kids who are at risk because of their learning disability than for kids who are at risk because of their poverty. I have yet to see the real live research done in an action-oriented sort of a way that would prove that point. What is true is that if kids cannot decode multisyllabic words for whatever reason, then there are interventions that work to be able to help them to be able to, to do that. That's the point. So blending classes across populations of at-risk kids based on similar instructional needs is, is, is what the RTI revolution is suggesting. So uh, option number four, you'll notice that, that you've got the, the classes, the general ed classes that are, that are heterogeneously grouped for tier one and in this case for tier two. Uh, kids re are requiring tier three intervention are removed from grade level curriculum and receive two block periods of intensive intervention. This is the alternative core kind of idea. The Tier 2 classes are homogeneously grouped to replace one elective class, and Tier 2 and 3 are parallel scheduled as much as, as possible. So Joanne goes on and talks about in, in some detail about the class configuration and schedules, et cetera, uh, in this uh, routine of, of, of PowerPoints. I want to ask uh, Barbara a question. Uh, will the people on the webinar have access to this PowerPoint? Yes, and actually I was going to stop you um, in a moment, really, to just uh, let you know that we have about 10 more minutes and, and quite a few more slides. And, and I didn't want to stop you because I could listen to you all day. I think not only was Lindy right in the very beginning by saying that you're compassionate, you're passionate, and extremely interesting, and, and, um, and I didn't want to stop you here. Um, but but um, yes, they are going to have access, and uh, that, that will come out from TCU's Answers Institute, and they'll send it out. Okay. Um, when we first started talking, uh, Barbara, is that my intention was not to read all these slides. So what I wanted to do is introduce you to Joanne's thinking, and I want you to look at these these PowerPoints. And if you have questions about what Joanne's saying, ask Joanne. Uh, go to go to her email address and ask her questions about this. So uh, actually, uh, Steve, Steve, the fact that you did open it up to me for a moment, um, th there is a question that did come through um, th that I thought was interesting, and perhaps um, it, maybe some of these slides answer it. But you, but um, I, I, I was asked to ask you really, since um, that slide was talking about scheduling, is RTR is RTI harder to schedule at a secondary level than? Uh, say in elementary or intermediate? Yeah, that's a very good question. There, the, the prevailing thought, the obvious thought, is that it's harder at the secondary level than it is at the elementary level. Um, uh, one of the other generals of the RTI Revolutionary Army is uh, Judy Elliott, who used to be the chief academic officer in Los Angeles Unified School District, that little teeny district of 700,000 out there on the left coast. And, and Judy started in Long Beach, California, and she started at the high school level. And when I asked her why years ago, she said, well, it was obvious why I started at the high school level. It's easier. I said, whoa, 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 why is it easier? She said, because high school and middle school are separated into these class periods. And if you can get control of the master schedule, you can really do this model pretty well and pretty easily. But at the elementary level, especially early elementary grades, there's just a full day to get things done. I think it gets a little bit more... I don't want to say departmentalized, but maybe subject matter kind of focused as you move from fourth to fifth to sixth grade. And so it gets a little bit more like the way scheduling is done at the secondary level. But uh, Judy's uh, re response to that is that it's actually easier at the secondary level. There, there's this perception that, that I think some high school teachers like us to have that they're tougher. I, I've not found that. I just find when you respect the fact that general ed teachers at the high school level are very much interested in their content and that they expect kids to be prepared when they come in their classroom, then if you show them that respect, they're very willing to talk about what can happen next. In fact, in fact, I think they're right. I think it's not fair to ask a general ed teacher to differentiate for a ninth grader reading at the first grade level without there being another class period that would help that child to be able to gain the skills the child needs. So it's a matter of that, of that a model that I shared with you informally early on. The way you see the world determines what you do that determines what you get. If you, if you ask a general ed teacher at the, at the high school level to flex enough for all the kids in the classroom, because after all, they're all there without any extra help, you can rest assured that as soon as you leave that classroom, that won't happen justifiably it won't happen for the science teacher. 
So we have to work as a team here, and we have to figure out how to make this work uh, in, uh, as a team. And, and I want to say one last thing about that, Barbara. The other mm -hmm. thing about the secondary level that's interesting to me is that I, I keep asking for people around the country to give me research that proves that when kids are taking a bunch of electives who are at-risk kids, they are more likely to stay in school and learn to read. I haven't seen that. What I have seen is that when you teach those kids how to read, they're more likely to stay in school. So that says something about the number of electives we give these tough-to-teach kids. In some schools I know around the country, the very best teachers to teach intervention are the teachers who are the teachers of the electives because they like these quirky kids. And so with that in mind, if you can show them how to, how to deal with an intensive intervention, they are wonderful teachers of that intensive intervention. Actually, that's a very, very interesting point because I, I, I too, have observed that and yet never articulated that. And, and I think that's an important point to, to stress <laughs> there. That's I, very it, interesting. It, I, it mm. makes sense to me. So take a look at what mm. Joanne's put together here, uh, and I want to just get to the very, very end of this. Um, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I was taught a long time ago in my high school speech class that you've got to tell people what you're going to do and then and then go through it and then tell people what you've done uh, at the end. And so uh, here's my zinger at the very end of this, Barbara, if I could, real quickly. Here are the five points of this issue called chaos. Um, I, I created one more acronym that is the word THRIVE because it's thriving on chaos. And I'd only share, you, share this with you very briefly, but think about these five, these, these five issues. That, that what we have to do is teach to student success. That's the key issue. Have high expectations for all students. Realize the potential of RTI. Make improvement based on data. Validate curricula based on student success with it. And lastly, use effective interventions and implement them with, with fidelity. That's what the word thrive would mean. I've done a, um, a, a few um, a retreats with uh, district staff and school staffs using that acronym of thrive. And they've talked about to what extent are we doing this. In the Henrico County Schools in Virginia is the example of this when they were trying to implement their RTI model. And we used this acronym as the basis of a day-long retreat so that they could see how close they were to actually realizing the potential of these five issues. All right. We've got to move from this notion of all students can learn to all students will learn. Um, I, I, used to, I used to facilitate uh, district, uh, district strategic planning to get people to put in the principle or the value all students can learn. It's a cop-out. Um, uh, there's a, a board of education I worked with in the southeast part of the country that said, we're not going to change that value from all students can learn to all students will learn, because if we did that, we'd be held accountable to the kids who live in the south part of the district. Well, yeah, of course you would, because you should be. So um, the Carnegie Council on Advancing Adolescent Literacy said in 2010, we already know enough to raise the overall uh, level of adolescent literacy in our school. The time to act is right now. So lastly, um, always remember, as, my, as, as one of my old friends said to me one time, it's always easier to get forgiveness than permission. But a new way of saying that is proceed until you're apprehended. <laughs> this is time for us to act right now. The, the student achievement gap, last statement, the student achievement gap will never be solved, in my view, until the adult gap between what we know and what we do is reduced to zero. We know how to do this. We're choosing not to. The time is now to act. Thank you very much, and I'll take whatever questions if we have any time left. Well, I think we're close to the end of the time. I did ask the two burning questions that were asked um, that, that came up during the, uh, during the presentation people wrote in to me, so I fielded those. I, I think before I hand to Lindy to close off, what I'd like to say is I, I think uh, your information was fabulous, and I think you've inspired all of us. Um, and in addition to the fact that uh, Steve has pointed us in the direction of Joanne throughout the presentation, um, Steve's uh, contact details are, will, will be made available to you and obviously he, he's, he's got a, a great deal to, to provide and offer so you'll have his contact um, uh, details as well and the PowerPoint presentation uh, will, will be sent out to you and available. Um, so again on my part, th thank you um, uh, Stephen, thank you for setting this entire framework for the webinar ser series. It, it, it's been wonderful. Um, Lindy, I'm just going to pass to you to, um, uh, to, to close this.
Well, um, I'd like to thank Steve as well. Um, My I think, pleasure, Lindy. Yeah, I think the rest of the series, um, as we talk about more details about what does it look like, what do we do, I think keeping these um, principles in mind should guide all of our work, and I really appreciate Steve for kicking it off. And thanks, Barbara, for hosting the webinar in Digital Directions International, and thanks to all the educators that called in today. Please think of Answers Institute at the College of Education at TCU as a resource for you. We're here to serve your needs, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for viewing this presentation of the Answers Institute webinar series on response to intervention.